Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session of the Rosalind Franklin Society 2021 year end virtual meeting from PhD to CEO. My name is Dr. Fei Lin, and I'm senior editor of Gen Biotechnology, the new peer review journal aiming to publish outstanding research and perspectives across the biotechnology field, launching in early 2022. You can learn more about us at genbiotechjournal.com. Now, women remain underrepresented in leadership positions in the biotech industry. Today, we're joined by a few incredible women who have reached the C-suite to talk about their personal journey transitioning from academic research to industry, as well as gain insight into the specific challenges of being underrepresented in their fields. On our panel today, we have Dr. Jennifer Buell, President and CEO of Mink Therapeutics, a clinical stage precision oncology company developing therapies for cancer and other immune mediated diseases. Dr. Janice Chen, co-founder and CTO of Mammoth Biosciences, a biotech company building next generation CRISPR products in therapeutics and diagnostics. And Dr. Nabia Saklian, co-founder and CEO of Selena, a company on a mission to make personalized cell therapies accessible for all patients. We're gonna start our session by letting our panelists introduce themselves and give us a glimpse into their journey. We'll then follow up with a Q&A. Now, Jennifer, I guess I'll start with you. If you could tell us a bit about your role at Mink Therapeutics and what brought you to become CEO of a company. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Really just proud and humble to be with my colleagues on the line here. It's a wonderful um, group to be a part of. So thank you very much, Dr. Lin, for the introduction. I'm Jennifer Buell, President and Chief Executive Officer of Mink Therapeutics. And I'll tell you my journey, it started when I think about it, when I think about some of the formative characteristics that brought me here, I think they were really just truly based in curiosity, identification of there are some problems that need a solution. And many of us pursuing graduate programs in science are pursuing those solutions. And I was really taken by evolutionary biology and immunology and how we can physically be interacting in an environment which, which comes with quite a, quite a number of threats. We're seeing this, of course, in present day pandemic, but prior to that, even day-to-day -day interactions with our environment, um, we have evolved to a position in which we can survive and thrive. And that's based on really formative components of our immune system, which we don't fully even understand at this point. So my, my doctoral work had been focused initially on taking different uh, nutrients, essentially carbon structures that we would consume, uh, that were formative in becoming first the first chemotherapeutic agents, methotrexate, et cetera, and really trying to understand how these building blocks can actually optimize or suppress our body's natural ability to defend or fend off uh, immune threats, diseases of the immune system, which of course, um, cancer is one, and there are a number of other immunologic disorders uh, that we're facing today. My journey brought me to a company that was focused initially on delivering the first personalized cancer vaccine. So taking a patient's tumor and creating their treatment from their tumor. And the technology was based on isolating different uh, antigens is what they're called that present to the immune system to educate the immune system on how to seek out and destroy the foreign body, this cancer because in our bodies, cancer appear to be normal tissues growing um, that, that ultimately don't stop growing. They're really complicated in that way. So we had this technology that would, would isolate, would take a patient's tumor, isolate these antigens, and then administer that back to the, to the patient. And we were able to identify that we could induce a really sophisticated direct immune attack on those antigens. So we could educate a patient's immune system. What we later came, became aware of was that the tumor in and of itself was shutting down that immune attack. And in that capacity, we needed more than just a vaccine in this case. So I was part of a company, the parent company of Mink is a Genus Therapeutics, and we had developed a platform. When I joined the company, there were 50 employees and a cancer vaccine. I was responsible for their global research and development operations. 
We expanded the company to over 500 employees. We brought 17 new discoveries into the clinic in about five years. And those were predominantly um, antibodies, multi-specific, monospecific programs, in addition to the vaccine technology. A big part of this story, though, is that we still were not seeing complete durable anti-tumor immunity. And we know that cell therapy, and this team is, is certainly an expert in this, cell therapies are a big part of the solution is being able to actually take cells that can expand this immunity. So what we had decided to do, and in October of this year, we launched Mink as a separate entity. So I, I changed my role. I was the president and chief operating officer of Agenis. As we built and expanded that company, Agenis will be focusing on antibody therapeutics, and Mink is focusing on delivering a very unique cell type, um, both in its native form and in its engineered form, to address uh, diseases of the immune system. So my journey was really built on, on, on trying to understand how we're surviving and thriving and why we're not, and how we can create some tools that would help us to engineer the immune system to actually enable many to really thrive and, um, and suppress immune-related diseases. Fantastic. Thank you, Jennifer. Janice, I'm passing it to you. Can you tell us a bit about your role at Mammoth and what led you to co-found your own company? Sure. Thank you, Faye. And it was fantastic to be a part of this panel. Um, my career is certainly much shorter than Jennifer's, but I think you know the underlying excitement around curiosity-driven science is something that has certainly inspired me along the way. Um, you know, just for, for me, you know, I'm the co-founder and CTO of Mammoth. And um, as we talked about, we are a company based in the San Francisco Bay Area developing the Nobel Prize winning CRISPR technology as a programmable search engine for the genome. So um, at Mammoth, we discover and develop novel CRISPR proteins that can detect anything anywhere and permanently cure genetic diseases. So um, a little bit about my background. Um, I've always been really fascinated by how fundamental science can lead to really impactful technologies. And my first, I would say, real exposure to lab research was was um, a course called Build a Genome back at an undergraduate uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins University. And you know, the mission here was to really build the yeast genome from scratch. So I was just fascinated by how you could take these fundamental building blocks, you know, little DNA oligos, and be able to uh, stitch them together to create you know, a full uh, yeast organism. And I think that was really um, my first kind of realization that biology was such a powerful technology uh, to help us reimagine the world. So that experience really led me to, um, you know, go into this world of synthetic biology. Um, I did a, you know, short uh, undergraduate research uh, program with uh, Val Kulata at the Hopkins School of Public Health, which brought me to Pam Silver's lab at Harvard Medical School. And then from there, I realized, you know, we have this incredible opportunity to really understand the fundamental mechanisms of the tools themselves that can uh, allow us to engineer biology. So that's where I um, sort of went back and said, look, I think um, in order to really improve, um, you know, these technologies, I wanted to go back to the basic science and the basic research. Um, and ultimately, that's what brought me to uh, UC Berkeley. Um, I think this was 2014. So at the time, you know, CRISPR was just starting to become uh, really kind of this uh, amazing tool for genome engineering. Um, this was still early days where there was lots of unknowns around how CRISPR proteins work. And for me, just the, the marriage of trying to understand these you know, proteins, these macromolecules, how they actually can go and create, you know, really important, you know, genetic changes um, was something that I just was extremely fascinated by. And I think especially because there was so much that was unknown um, and so much kind of mechanistic questions uh, was a real motivation for me to actually join uh, Jennifer Downer's lab at UC Berkeley. Um, so, you know, one other really important part of my journey is um, that actually all almost every single one of my uh, research experiences was led by women. So um, at undergrad, um, going into post, post back, and then all of my rotations at Berkeley were led by female PIs. So I kind of come from this unique world where I've always seen women at the helm. And so it's never really scared me to say, okay, we can think big, we can ask big questions. And a lot of this was uh, frankly, just due to the most exciting science that was going on. So um, I think that's always um, really just, um, I think a special part of um, sort of my, my journey throughout uh, graduate school. Um, so, you know, going back to, to CRISPR, right? I think um, one of the amazing things is that these are, these are 
you know, molecular machines, all of these CRISPR enzymes have these unique capabilities that um, through, you know, research and, and mechanism, we can start to understand how they work. And a lot of that um, was, again, my motivation for diving deeply into, uh, you know, different enzymes and, and how that biochemistry comes together to create new applications. Um, so during my PhD, I also formed a really fantastic collaboration with one of my lab mates, uh, Lucas Harrington, who is also now a co-founder of Mammoth. And together, you know, we, we started to understand that there was just so much in CRISPR biology beyond just the Cas9 enzyme, which had made a significant splash, you know, um, in 2012, which eventually won the Nobel Prize. And we realized that there's an entire universe of CRISPR enzymes and it, we're just really scratching the surface. And so a lot of the work um, was sort of this process of let's uncover a new enzyme and then let's take it into the lab and start to dissect kind of the different components. You know, what does the protein do? What are the parts of the RNA that allows the, that protein to be guided to a particular sequence? And then, you know, what, what does that open up in terms of applications? So I think it wasn't until um, my third year of graduate school, you know, we had gone through um, understanding how the Cas9 proteins work. We started looking at other enzymes like CasX, CasY, and then all of a sudden there was this um, a recently discovered enzyme called Cas12, which uh, we realized there was some strange activity that we couldn't quite understand. So we kept, you know, starting to uh, look at different, uh, you know, experiments and ultimately recognize that this activity actually uh, was, a, was a new capability for CRISPR to actually detect DNA. Um, once we showed that work robustly in the lab, it was sort of like, we have to go and see if we can take this and show it in an application. And at that point, um, I started to send out cold emails to other labs um, in the Bay Area. So UC Berkeley doesn't have a medical school, so sent emails to professors at UCSF and said, hey, we have this potentially new uh, you know, molecular detection method. Can we use it to detect um, you know, certain diseases in patient samples? And uh, one of the professors at UCSF um, actually said, yes, let's work together and see if we can make this uh, technology um, prove itself in, in blinded patient samples that were infected with HPV. So um, together with uh, Dr. Joel Polevsky, uh, we formed this fantastic collaboration really just in a matter of days. And we were able to show that you could program CRISPR to detect HPV uh, in, in these samples. And so I think that was really the spark for us in terms of saying, wow, you know, this was a fundamentally new discovery in terms of how CRISPR could be used. And here we were able to develop a diagnostic method for this technology uh, and really show that it was robust and had this prototype working. So that was kind of the, um, for me, I think the, the wake up call that was uh, really saying, look, there's no better time than just to go in, jump, jump right in and take the risk to, to start a company with the idea that, you know, you could go from fundamental discovery to new applications. And so we partnered with a colleague, Trevor Martin at Stanford, and with Jennifer's support, we um, formed, you know, Mammoth Biosciences, initially focused on diagnostics. And as the company's grown, our mission has also grown because we recognize that one of the core competencies of the company was to um, enable new CRISPR enzymes for, you know, areas beyond diagnostics. So recently, um, we've announced sort of our intention of moving into the therapeutic space with these ultra small enzymes. And, you know, it's only the beginning. I think um, that's the beauty of having this innovation engine as part of the company, because you can really just start to dream and look at areas where your technology can have an impact. So it's been a fantastic journey and um, look forward to, to discussing more. Great. Thank you so much, Janice. Nabia, can you tell us about your role at Salino and what led you to co-found your company? Thank you, Faye. So excited to be here with all of you, inspiring women, inspiring leaders, and um, it's exciting. It's a great way to start the week. Um, and uh, yeah, so my story, I I am a physicist by training, which is uh, perhaps a little unusual. So I was doing my PhD at Harvard, but um, got very interested in using physics to solve problems in biology. That was my focus in my thesis. So it was working in the clean room, working in optics labs, and eventually ended up inventing new ways of using laser-based methods to transfect cells. And that, that was my first introduction to CRISPR. Um, and CRISPR was just emerging in the space at the time. It was a fascinating time. So, you know, I, very similar to Jan's story, I loved emailing experts and knocking on a lot of doors. And the Harvard Stem Cell Institute is across the street from the Harvard Physics Department. So I just 
went over there and I said, do you need new technologies to deliver CRISPR into cells? And they said, absolutely. This looks really cool. Let's try it. So I was gunning for a chapter in my thesis um, to say, oh, I work with some biologists and it didn't really work, but we tried to do some experiments. And little did I know that the last um, six months of my PhD, things would just really take off. So I was collaborating with George Church, Derek Rossi, David Scadden, brilliant biologists, and who also happened to be very entrepreneurial. And their take was, wow, there's something about being able to use laser precision in engineering cells that's really captivating, and you should think about doing a startup. And it was a, a major inflection point in my life because I'd never thought about the entrepreneurship path. But I think regions of the U.S., such as the Boston area and the Bay Area, you know, there's this really wonderful mix of scientists stepping into entrepreneurship. And that really happened with our generation of scientists, which I'm very fortunate that I found myself in Boston at that time. And um, got, that's how the idea of the startup came into being. The first thing I did was I need to build a team. I want to work with people who are smarter than me in different dimensions because I don't have all the answers. So I uh, brought on Marina Madrid, who's an applied physicist, nanofabrication expert as a co-founder. And then we met Matthias Wagner, who's been a serial entrepreneur in the Boston area and has industrialized optical technologies. He's worked in the biospace. He's built foundries. So that's how we got started, uh, end of 2017, and then really started working full-time in 2018. And the past several years have been just so incredible. Everything has been beyond my wildest expectations to come from very much a physics lens, having this very broad platform technology where you could engineer cells, many different types of cells in many different ways. And then thinking through what, where do we want to take it in terms of product market fit and where do we build a business? I think that's a big tra transition that as I went through as a scientist, when I put on my CEO hat, we have to build a business. Um, so that's been phenomenal. And um, we are excited and beyond thrilled to be working in the stem cell derived therapy space, specifically in the in the induced pluripotent stem cell space, iPSCs. Again, another Nobel Prize winning technology that has tremendous potential to cure degenerative diseases across age-related blindness, diabetes, heart disease, Parkinson's, like an infinite list of different applications. And you see huge companies being launched in this space just over the past two years or so, you know, Sana, Blue Rock, and, um, you know, the semi acquisition by Vertex. And what we discovered through my hundreds of customer interviews, as, as I told you, I love knocking on doors, is that manufacturing was a massive bottleneck. It's very difficult to generate iPSCs, to expand them, and then also to differentiate them to your final tissue state. So, what we've built at Selino is an autonomous platform that can do all of those steps in a closed system. And that's important because if you're able to make high quality cells in a closed system using an AI driven approach, you can massively bring down uh, manufacturing costs by 10 to 100 X, be able to run hundreds and thousands of patient samples in a parallel way at the same facility. So that's what we do. We still use lasers, which is cool because I get to <laughs> carry that forward with my training, but in very different ways. Um, and it's been really, really exciting. So we're about 22 people and growing very rapidly. And this uh, next year is going to be all about building out our machine learning and software team. We've built a very strong foundation there. But really, if we want to maximize yield and automate very complex human processes, that's where we're investing. So our, our machine learning and deep learning team is going to be the largest, which I'm very, very excited about because there's so much to learn. So that's a little bit of my story. And very excited about everything that's happening in biotech, where we have incredible new tools, we have incredible new science, and we're rapidly pushing them all towards translation for patients. And that's ultimately why we're all here. And I love that. Um, that's been my motivation from the beginning. And I'm just so thrilled that we get to do that. Fantastic. I am so inspired by all of your stories and I think as a fellow woman in STEM, it's really inspiring to see more women at these leadership positions in these C-suites. And I'm really excited to talk more about 
your journey and what advice you may have for other individuals interested in following a similar path. And with that, the theme of this session is from PhD to CEO. And one of the first things I wanted to ask is what advice would you give to PhD students interested in rising to leadership roles in industry? Well, I, I would say I, one of the most critical informative things for me, you have to be fearless and curious. A challenge that I, I think many PhD students are faced with is that there, there remains um, a bias that PhD students will be on an academic track and that's it, right? And there are a lot of ways to bring value to your science and your concepts, the work that you're doing. Um, and that could be through business. It could be through academic appointments without question through clinical practice, scientific practice, lab work. There are a lot of ways in which you can take concepts and advance them. And I think it's really important to be reflective about how you can optim, what kind of environment do you perform the best in? And what capabilities do you bring that can accelerate delivering your solutions um, to patients? When I was in, in grad school, it was a, a challenge um, to let my advising committee know that I was going to be pursuing an appointment in industry. It was just not, it was not well supported. Uh, and, and so I did a few things that probably slowed my progress because I was satisfying my committee by taking a fellowship at the NIH and then retaining an academic appointment while dabbling in a process that I thought could accelerate discoveries for patients um, by scaling it using industrialization. And, um, and Nabiha just mentioned the importance of manufacturing. That's a technology that's entrenched in science. And in order to bring your, your ideas to, to patients, you need to be able to manufacture them at scale. And that does require, in many cases, um, industrialization outside of academics. So I, I, my advice would be, be truly open-minded identify where you really want to go with your career, with your science, with your technology, and then appreciate that there truly are limitless places to take your science and, and not to be averse to industry. Yeah, I agree with Jennifer completely. I would also add that um, I think in today's time, certainly I think there's a lot more open-mindedness from universities from PIs and recognizing that there are multiple career paths. So I would say take advantage of that. Like if people are giving you, people are opening doors for you, just go through them. Um, I think for me personally, what helped me a lot in thinking through the next step was attending panels like these. Um, at Berkeley, they hosted many career panels and people, you know, at all different walks of life, going into industry, starting companies, going into, you know, government agencies. So I think just getting a picture uh, was really helpful for me to start to sort of mentally think about what's next. And actually, um, being an entrepreneur was not on the top of the list, but I think being in an environment where you where we saw that there were so many opportunities and um, different ways, like Jennifer said, of taking the science forward, um, it gave me the confidence to say, yeah, I could do this. And also there's just nothing to lose, right? You, you're a PhD student, you're probably making, you know, $30,000 a year, like what is there to lose? So I think that was the other piece of it as well. I mean, it was sort of a, a no brainer at once, once I got the confidence that this is something that I really wanted to do. So I think, you know, the other thing I'll add is that sometimes you don't have to figure everything out at that stage. I think what's more important is understanding what you're passionate about, because once you can sort of center in on, on what your kind of um, core values and motivations are, then it, then it becomes less stressful in a way to start to um, explore different areas that you that you might be interested in. And I think the most important thing for me was just to not be afraid to take risks, um, you know, and just making sure that you're really um, kind of making sure that you, any fears that you have, you can sort of manage that and then really make sure you follow your dreams. I love all of that advice. It's fantastic. The other piece I would just layer on is being okay with failure. And a lot of us inherently maybe I've experienced that at some point in the PhD where things just don't work out. <laughs> um, and it's it builds a ton of resilience and there's a lot of parts about company building and entrepreneurship and, and you know commercializing new technologies where you just don't know if it's going to work, but as long as you feel like you're growing, you're learning new skills, you should try it out. And that's that's how I see it always, I'm very selfish in the way that I always want to keep growing. And that that's why entrepreneurship 
is a great fit for me. The other practical thing I want to mention, looking back, I have always gravitated towards having, for lack of a better word, mentors or friend tours, friends who are mentors is maybe a better way to describe it. People who are older than me and have done really interesting things in their lives, have cool experiences, um, just collecting those people. So if you're in the middle of your PhD, go and find five people that you met or at a conference or you saw, found them on LinkedIn and may build a connection with them and talk to them about what you're thinking about in terms of your career, because it'll just open up a lot of different pathways that are very difficult to imagine alone. Um, so I highly encourage you to lean into that. Fantastic. And I think a related question to follow up to that about the topic of mentors is that there are some labs and or institutions that are known for having great resources on establishing new companies. And then there are other labs and institutions without those resources. So given that everyone's resources does vary, what advice do you have for finding support, mentors, opportunities, and or resources in how to get established in biotech? That's a great question. I'll jump in because it's very top of mind for me these days. I get lots of personal messages from uh, grad students, postdocs, undergrads, um, people who are just thinking about entrepreneurship, they read about me, and I think it's fantastic. And I get these messages from all over the world, literally. Um, so I don't think you have to be dependent on what's available in your ecosystem because there's so many online resources. There's so many resources available at a broader scale. And I love it. I love a cold LinkedIn message. It's hard because I can't say yes to all of those engagements. I'm trying to think how that's scalable, but really just reach out um, and even finding people who are you know, thinking along the same lines as you. If you have other friends, postdocs, grad students, who are all thinking about entrepreneurs, you can start your own group and start inviting speakers. I've seen that happening at the University of Waterloo, which I thought was amazing. Um, so Ultimately, you know, if, if you really want to go down this entrepreneurship path or be on a path to get to C-level executive positions, it does require a lot of taking ownership of building those relationships, taking steps forward. So if that feels too hard for you, it's okay. You don't have to go down that path. But if you're really committed to it, geography is not going to be a barrier to limit you. Um, one of my friends, Jack at Ochre Bio, they're based in the UK. I always find it amazing that he's building this global company and they were in Y Combinator over in San Francisco from the UK. Really in this global Zoom age now, it's 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 a great time to lean into it and lean into the normalcy of connecting online. So um, yeah, so looking at local resources, of course, and expanding your scope and just connecting with as many people as you can. Yeah, plus one on network building. I think that was something that was really challenging for me, frankly, as a PhD student. Over time, it becomes more natural because it becomes less of a, you know, I think sometimes people think networking is like very transactional, but it really isn't. It's about trying to understand what people's motivations are, trying to figure out if we can build something together. Um, I think a concept that was introduced to me a, a couple, um, I would say maybe even a year ago now, is like this idea of like building your personal board of directors. So like what Nabia said, you know, figure out those people who can be your support system and mentors and actually think about, okay, are there different perspectives that, that they can offer? Can they challenge kind of my way of thinking? Because, you know, sometimes you are your own inhibitor right in a lot of ways so when you have people that you trust who can say actually you know you can look here are your strengths like here's different here's a different way of looking at the problem uh, i think that's incredibly important um the other piece too is you know certainly as a phd student sometimes you feel like a lot of your career is dependent on your pi i think in my case i had an incredibly supportive pi you know jennifer downer was just so amazing in terms of trying to <laughs> unlock opportunities um, for her students for for women in science um so i, I definitely uh i'm very, very grateful for that. But I also recognize not everyone has the opportunity. So I think recognizing that your support system is not just your PI, but your peers, you know, other people um, that uh, kind of have walked your path, I think is really in important as well. So just sort of broadening um, what a support or a mentor even is, is going to uh, help you get to that first step. 
I think these are such a, you guys have made incredible points here. It's in this world today, leveraging technology and platforms and access can exponentiate your network, uh, which I think is really um, opportunistic. It could at some points though, seem overwhelming. So I, I would say, I, you know, and Jenna's just mentioned this, if, if you are thinking about it in um, just by curiously, how can we deliver a solution? And you start that conversation, your network continues to grow because you're going to be engaging with like-minded people. You have to do it with some structure and in an organized format and with outcomes. If you could set some goals to establish platform relationships that can really truly help you to open up opportunities and you systematically take the time out of your day to do so and have coffee with people and then to learn from, don't be afraid to ask individuals if they may know someone who can who can help. Uh, I think that that has been for me was continuing to lean on friends and colleagues and board members into their network. And then as you start to expand that, you'll be shocked and you keep that conversation open. You're learning, you're developing relationships and in the absence of transactions, which I think are the most valuable, I think that's so important is you, if you think about you don't have to bring something but a question, but a partnership, but an idea. And if you have that, you're going to find a like-minded person who will then start to work with you to expand your network. I think that that's networking, though, is, is so foundational to, um, to building and expanding and growing. Great. And I hear this theme of networking throughout your answers. And a, a good follow-up question to that are... What are some ways that the industry can support more women starting these companies and entering biotech? Well, I'll just say a few things. First of all, I think leading and setting examples are, are that's one really important step is actually investing the time to show what's possible. And then being really attentive, I think, as a leader in an organization, being truly connected and, and attentive to what those individuals in your organization aspire to do. And then to be accessible. And Nabiha mentioned that she's getting LinkedIn you know, notes and there's a, there's a lot of inbound quest, requests that do come in. And of course, we all are quite consumed by our day-to-day -day work. But if you can, as leaders in the industry, I do think it comes to individuals, if you can actually take the time and respond and lend a hand and help and be attentive and open up opportunities where they're possible, I think that, that you'll start setting examples and changing the trends in industry. We're doing that with board appointments and otherwise. It's just expanding our network and expanding our search. And in a Zoom world, in a virtual world, we could do that much more effectively to get access to talent far beyond our geographic borders. And that, that if you can be truly committed to doing so, we've seen a lot of rewards. We have a lot of interested, high quality talent, women, minority, minorities, others, um, who we've been able to benefit from just by opening up our, our boundaries. Yeah, I, I think um, I agree with that completely. And the other piece, I think it's important for companies to be intentional and the industry to be intentional about opening, you know, opportunities for for women and minorities. I think um, the reality is that there is still a significant gap. I think when you look at, especially at the higher levels of the company, women and minorities who are able to achieve those roles. Um, I personally believe that being an entrepreneur is perhaps one of the best ways to get women and minorities into leadership roles. I can certainly say that if I tried to go down the traditional path, go into you know, big pharma, I work my way up the ladder, I don't think maybe in the, even in this lifetime, I could have the opportunity I have today. So I think one, uh, one way is to supercharge that by you know, investing in, you know, women-led businesses, minority-led businesses, people of diverse backgrounds, because I do fundamentally believe that startups are one of the best vehicles for enabling that kind of growth and really funneling, I, I would say, substantial change. Because I think what you see is that when you invest in women and minorities, they then will take it back to their own communities and start to grow, you know, and that that's a very scalable way of trying to um, just, just create greater diversity in our industry at, at large. Yeah, beautifully stated, Janice, about us as companies taking ownership, and then Jennifer also talking about how we open our doors. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this the past year or so of how biotech leadership needs to evolve and reflect the societies and patient populations we're serving. 
Otherwise, how we're just going to miss things. We're not going to be able to make decisions that are in the patient's best interest because we don't know what experience they're going through. So that's definitely becoming a personal mandate of mine for the next decade of how do we bring about that shift? Because, you know, I'm in Kendall Square, I look around and uh, not many companies that are led by people like me, even people who look like me. So um, it, it's, there's a movement happening, which is very exciting. But I will say, I do feel there's a disproportionate burden on women and minority leaders for us to keep our doors open and, you know, have the conversation going. And there's only so much we can do, given that we're all running our own companies and businesses and we have to do exactly the same amount of work that other CEOs have to do and leaders have to do. And, you know, and then the pressure is on also to perform because there's so few of us. Um, so I do think there needs to be a more, more of an industry-wide push that is very collaborative. It also has to come from all directions um, and all, all types of people in the industry, which is currently predominantly led by um, uh, white white men. And, uh, but I, I do, you know, what, what's great about my experience is I have several mentors who are CEOs in the biotech industry who are older white men, and they're so committed to supporting me to get ahead in my career. So I do see that. And I'm always just wondering, can we organize that better? How do we organize that? Because I know that interest is there because I see it every day. And then the other piece is there's only so much we as biotech leaders can do and we as companies can do. I think venture capital also plays a very important role in uh, making sure a lot of these technologies are translating from academia into industry. How do we train the next generation of scientists to be able to lead their companies? And not everybody has to be a CEO. Um, you know, I think um, there are many different roles when companies are founded and some people are better suited to such certain roles and others are not. But I do think we need more of a grassroots level push. I think there's always really positive discussion about it. We support minorities. We want to see more women-led companies. But when it comes to actually taking actions on how are you allocating those venture capital dollars, um, it, it's hard though. It's hard because you know, in, in the physics space, we're, you know, most physics PhD programs are 20% women. So we're already losing larger representation or equal representation of women in these programs. And then also on top of that, trying to see how we can translate those to entrepreneurship efforts. Um, so there's a lot of pieces that, you know, we just see a lot of drop off at every stage of our careers. And then of course, when you look at the earliest stages of STEM education, yes, we need to do better. <laughs> so um, there's something that I, I work on with a nonprofit called the Plenary out of Bay Area. It's called I'm a Scientist. And the mission there is to inspire middle school kids to give science a chance. So we sent these beautiful posters to 2,500 classrooms around the world with pictures of scientists that don't really look like your typical scientists. Um, I don't know if I presented many solutions here. I just <laughs> acknowledged just the range of challenges that we're facing. And I think we just have to work on all of them as much as we can. And we got to move quickly because uh, I read a study that the U.S. is going to be majority, um, you know, majority uh, people of color by 2045. So if we want to have biotech leadership reflect the societies we're serving and the patient population, we, we have to move right now. I love those themes of allyship and taking more action oriented approaches versus more we'll we'll say like saying the problems and taking the polls i think what i heard from these answers was really we know what the issues are let's take some action and let's have a grassroots approach on how we want to approach these issues and with that, what were some of the challenges of being a woman at varying stages of your careers, whether that be from science research side to the leadership roles at your biotech companies? And how did you handle those challenges? I'll step in because Janice had made a comment earlier that um, <laughs> that she's had less time from her PhD to career than I have. <laughs> so I'm a bit older than these lovely young women here with me. Um, and I'd say that during my time, I think the representation was different. I did have, I was, you know, um, when I was 
uh, at the parent company, we had a predominant uh, male, white male management team and board fully. Um, I think that there has there's been a, a major shift in that. Um, but but it, at the time, it was more difficult. I'll say that maybe it was perception because I do think in some respect we create our own reality. But I did have a sense that it was much harder without having female leadership or female um, mentorship within an organization. It becomes more difficult to push through and to um, to to be a sort of um, shoulder to shoulder with with a predominantly um, you know unified or, or mono specific kind of um, um, leadership team. I think it's really difficult. So once you start to once diverse once you start to expand and you start imposing some diversity, it becomes a little bit easier. My my experience has been that. So how did I handle it? I um, I worked. Uh, exhaustively and was incredibly visible and vocal about what I was doing, what my teams were doing, how we were performing, um, the successes that we were creating. And it took me quite a bit of time and actually some investment in coaching on how to best articulate these performance markers and to be visible about them at the right time and in the right place, but to be, um, to be you know, to really take a stand and for your team and for your accomplishments and not to back down and to not have any insecurity about who you are um, as a as a as a female or someone who's different than the predominant management um, team at the time so i was probably uh, just uh, maybe some might say a little overly vocal, but I felt like we were, you know, the teams that I was working with and the scientists and the work that we were creating was just extraordinary. So I had a lot to work with and I just became a megaphone about it and it was hard to ignore me. <laughs> and so as I, as I was promoted in my career, I just made it really clear and opportunistic. I made sure that we set up an HR infrastructure that allowed a whole diverse pool of talent to make it through the ladder and that it was set up to accommodate working moms and just a whole, it was a, a big investment in my time went into setting up an, an operational platform for human resources to open up ladders and opportunity development opportunities across the board. So I think that, that that's important, but I am, I've been thrilled with um, in expanding, we are seeing some progress in diversity, certainly as even as a measure of this panel right here. Um, and I, I just I hope we can we can exponentiate that. Yeah, I love what Jennifer's saying. And actually, I probably need to chat with you after this panel to hear about how you set up those those pipelines for talent, because we're still a startup, right? We're figuring this out. How do we make sure that we continue to grow uh, talent in the organization? Um, you know, one of, like I said earlier, one of the unique things about my journey is that I always saw a woman at the top. So it never was something that I questioned. I think actually coming and starting a company was perhaps one of the first times I was like, whoa, this is actually not the norm, right? All of a sudden you're thrown into me uh, meetings where you're the only woman of color. And I think that was kind of jarring for me coming from academia where there was that um, almost psychological safety. And then suddenly you're in this environment where you're not one of the guys, right? And I think that was something I had to figure out how to navigate. And um, part of it, I think, is just being your authentic self and just not being afraid of being different. I think that took me a while in terms of saying, actually, being different, different is a strength, right? It's not a weakness. And in fact, that's what allows us to kind of push ourselves forward and, and take risks. We can offer a new perspective and really challenge what, you know, traditional ways of thinking. So um, I think, uh, you know, for me personally, um, again, finding those allies who can help work with you, having, having a coach, um, I think has also been really helpful for me to kind of manage, you know, situations where I do feel a little bit overwhelmed and say, okay, well, I can look at the situation objectively and see how I can improve um, in, in kind of future opportunities. So I think it's a learning process. I don't think you go in knowing what you're doing almost ever, um, but you have to accept that you are going to learn and be better. And um, the, I think the world is becoming more sophisticated. We are moving in the right direction, but I agree with Nabia, we have to move faster. And I, like I said, I do think um, you know, starting something new is perhaps one of the best ways to accelerate that because you get to write the rules and hopefully write them in a way that will um, you know, lift all boats. So. Oh, so much to unpack, both of you. I know this is the first time I was meeting, but I, I feel this connection. Yeah, we're gonna. We need to. We need to stay in touch. Um, yes, lots to unpack. You know, for me, it was a little bit the reverse in a strange way. I felt physics was very 
um, not balanced. And there was also no real effort to have more women in leadership roles. You know, I think all of the professors were just terrible at acknowledging all of these things. And anyway, so it was a disaster. So coming out of physics, I came in with really thick skin. So I do think in biotech, everything is just a lot more positive. And um, even on the venture capital side, I find it more positive than qualifying exams in the physics department. Um, so that helps a lot because I've been in a worse situation where I've seen what it's like to be underrepresented. And uh, there are also power dynamics are different because in, in a PhD, there really is a very clear power ladder and professors control your destiny. And that makes it very challenging because um, they're also missing a lot of self-awareness around the issues on implicit bias. Like there's no way you could ever have that conversation. So you need to figure out what your leverage is going to be in these types of negotiations. Like I needed a new laser in the lab and my advisor said, we don't have money and blah, blah, blah. So I had to write grants, you know, and then I had to go behind his back to get data in another lab and show up with data that, yeah, we really need a new laser. Uh, it was just, it was just this constant struggle. Um, which is why I'm very optimistic about where our industry is going in my day to day. I think facts really matter and performance matters and that's how we're being evaluated. Yes, implicit bias is a thing, <laughs> scientifically true across the board. I mean, we also have our own implicit biases against other groups. Um, so important to keep that in check. I am looking into bringing in more training resources at our company at all levels to have more honest discussions about that because we do have people from all different backgrounds, from all age groups, experience levels, even the PhD, non-PhD, both of those angles we have about half and half of both within the company, but, and they're these, these um, things we're taught about, oh, PhDs are at a different level and better than other people or they're different, different scientific disciplines are better in some way. Just all this crap that has been programmed <laughs> into our minds that we have to unlearn. Um, so I think uh, maybe most important thing for me has always been being strict, true to myself, being very grounded. And I think my family keeps me very grounded. My mom uh, always reminding myself of everything she had to go through to be the first woman to go to college, a small town in northern Bangladesh. And because of that choice and that fight she fought, I get to do the things I'm doing right now. So even if it's a little rough at moments, things are a little uncomfortable, I'm not going to back down. I can't. Yeah. Fantastic. Now, as we're wrapping up this session, my last question is, what is one message that you want to share with our audience about being a woman going from PhD to CEO? It is super hard. And if I had to give you my honest recommendation, don't do it. There's nothing glamorous about it. You know, like Jennifer, Janice and I are sitting here and telling you this is great. This is great. No, it, it is great. And it's a great way to have impact, but it is super hard. And you will be paying prices that you cannot anticipate and you will not be able to measure. Like I've paid prices on my health that I can't get back. That's what I'll say. <laughs> Yeah, you, it's. I wish there was a better way to to show how hard it is, right? Like we love to be here and inspire people to to do these crazy things, but the reality is, yeah, there is so much stuff that goes on underneath that that no one ever sees, except for maybe you and and your closest friends and family. I think um, that being said, you know, I there's sacrifices that everyone has to take to to be able to take new ideas forward. I think having that opportunity, I guess, is sometimes beyond our wildest imagination. I think opportunity is something that um, I've been so grateful to have in my life. And as much as we can give opportunity to more people, I think the world will be a better place. I'm, I guess my, my key advice would just be, just find your guiding principles for yourself. Keep asking why, you know, don't ever just be complacent, continue to push yourself, continue to grow, and you'll, you'll be in a better place because of it. Outstanding. I I agree. This is it's it's very it's very hard. There's no question. And you you must be prepared to, to make sacrifices and trade-offs. I will say though, from my perspective, it's really rewarding to push yourself to the limits that you even 
perceived or believed to be possible. And then further, and I never would have believed that I would be the CEO of a biotech company with the opportunity to not only develop talent, but to bring solutions to patients, to extend life. I mean, those are those are, are the rewards of that, I think, are just extraordinary, but they it cannot be underestimated. They do certainly come at, at, a, at a cost. And so you need to be intentional about what you want to do. Um, but but certainly just really keep pushing. And then when you think you've hit the limits of possibility, but you want more, push again because <laughs> you can get there. It, it comes with some exhaustion, but <laughs> But I think I think that you you women have are just extraordinary and so accomplished, and I'm so impressed and proud to be here. Um, but I, I and I love your perspective because you do make it look easy. Both of you make it look very easy. All of you, I'll say. <laughs> so thank you for the opportunity to talk today. Great, and thank you all for sharing your incredible journeys and being the inspiring women that you are. I'm sure there are many individuals who are going to benefit a lot who are looking to navigate this path, but are looking for resources on how to do that. And this panel is definitely going to be a fantastic catapult into what that journey is going to look like. So thank you again, Jennifer, Janice, and Nabia for taking the time to share your journey with us. This brings us to the end of this session. My name is Dr. Phelan, Senior Editor of Gen Biotechnology. Thank you for tuning into this session of the Rosalind Franklin Society 2021 year-end virtual meeting from PhD to CEO. Stay safe and we'll see you again soon. Thank you.